So we went to the back of the theater, and these women, they're screaming, standing out of their seat, kill him, kill him, motherfucker! Like, whoa. I mean, it was touching kind of on something that was beyond this movie. Hello, I'm Patricia Arquette, and this is the timeline of my career. I'm a fourth generation actor. My great grandparents were in vaudeville. My grandfather was in live TV and radio. And my sister and my father were actors before I started. So it was always a part of our life and how we expressed ourselves and something that our family really valued a lot. I remember auditioning for A Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three, which entailed a lot of screaming. <laughs> I was pretty young and excited about that series. I've always loved horror. I never knew that I was gonna be recast. I'm glad that Chuck Russell stepped in to intervene. There were sometimes on the set, they would get upset with certain choices that I'd make. Like I'd try a door handle in a dream and then I'd turn and then I'd try it again. But that was just my instinct. And they ended up using it in the movie. They didn't use the other takes where I tried it once. So sometimes I would get yelled at for choices that I'd make, but then they'd end up in the cut. One important lesson that I learned on that set was you have to be aware of your body and listen to your body. We were in this kind of bee smoke all the time. And when we finished shooting, I had these terrible, terrible pains in my ovaries. And I went to my doctor and I had these cysts and then they dissolved and just went away on their own. And we went to do reshoots and I was in that smoke again. And then I got that same attack and I was like, this stuff is really not healthy for you. Mind if I smoke? Uh, no, no, no. Listen, do you mind filling me in on what I missed? Listen, wait for me. No, no. True Romance was such a pivotal film for me. Tony, as a director, was kind of the ideal girl dad. Every idea I'd have, he'd be like, that's a great idea, let's do that. He taught me very young, listen to your instincts. You have very good ideas. You know what your character's doing. Make suggestions, they're good, try them on screen. And it was funny, because he wasn't like that at all with Christian, but I think that that has informed me every single day of my work ever since. Hi. <laughs> Hi. The scene starts with James Gandolfini's character explaining to her what it was like the first time he killed someone. And by the end of the scene, she's killed someone, and it's him. It was very early on in my career, and someone said, you should go see it, it's on, playing on Hollywood Boulevard. So we went to the back of the theater, and these women, they're screaming, standing out of their seat, kill him, kill him, motherfucker! Like, whoa! What you making? Booties for my father. Gets cold in the hospital. Mm. Has he been here long? This is my 13th pair. I got to meet Kathy O'Hara, who I portrayed in Ed Wood. My sister Alexis was already dressing in drag and doing shows in drag, but hadn't really come out as transgender. And there was this whole storyline with Ed Wood where he was a cross-dresser. And being able to talk to Kathy, who accepted Ed, loved Ed, didn't judge Ed for being a, a cross-dresser in the 1950s was really a beautiful thing. And I remember she said to me, you know, Eddie was so funny the way he looked at the world and he saw beauty and everything. And one day I showed up and I was meeting him and I was wearing this kind of rust-colored suit. And Eddie goes, stop, stop right there. I gotta get you something and ran down the street and then ran back. And he's like, look at this gardenia. It's exactly the color of your suit. Now, of course, that's like a dying gardenia. It's like a rotting gardenia. It was so beautiful. Like Eddie didn't realize that it was something other people would cast away. He saw the beauty in this and she saw the beauty in Eddie seeing the beauty in this thing and the innocence of his vision of the world. So beautiful to see somebody who could love people like that. It's nice to know I can still make you laugh. I like to laugh, Fred. And there's no filmmaker like David Lynch, and there's no filmmaker that, for me as an actor, worked the same way David Lynch did. And I'm sure he works in different ways, but on that particular job, I would say, 
all right, David, am I playing two people or one person? Is one a ghost? Is this an illusion? I don't know, what do you think, Arquette? The tremendous amount of faith and trust that he has in his talent, his cast is kind of amazing and terrifying. I knew that he wrote the script during the O.J. Simpson trial. And watching O.J. Simpson in that trial, it seemed like all the evidence was pointing to him killing his wife. And yet when I'd hear him talk, I didn't believe him, but I believed he believed him at a certain point. The way that I looked at Lost Highway was, this man loves his wife, but he can't admit to himself that he's a misogynist. He kills her, but he can't remember killing her because he can't see himself as that guy who would kill his wife. My interpretation of it was all the machinations of the monsters that women were in his mind and how he killed her and couldn't even admit to himself he killed her. The windows won't open and the children and I would enjoy a breeze now and then. I can fix that. I got an opportunity to work on Holes, and Andy Davis was our director, and he was lovely. And I really love the character of Kissing Kate. She loved Sam the Onion Man, and he loved her. And it was kind of magical being a part of that movie because there's people of a certain age when they come up to them, you, you are. I'm like, oh, you saw Holes. I see the truth. I see it. It's like a freaking television show and the dreams. Dreams are dreams. Everybody dreams. Well, does everybody see dead people standing around their bed? I kind of saw that movies were going in this direction already where it was moving towards these tent pictures and less art films. Because movie actors were not doing TV then. And I decided, let me try to jump into this thing and see how it is. Glenn Gordon Karen is really a very talented writer. Jake Weber who played my husband, is an incredible actor. And it was really the family story. The real challenge of television like that, to be the lead in a one hour that you're in almost every single scene, it was utterly exhausting to shoot 22 episodes of something. It makes you fast, you learn your lines really fast. It hones a lot of skills. You also have to like jump into things and that's kind of a great exercise in itself. A lot of people watch that show with their family a lot of people were like, that was mine and my mom's show. We'd watch it together. And that's beautiful to be a part of that. And again, my grandpa was in live TV. He was on Hollywood Squares. To be a part of the history of television is great. Turn back, turn back. I don't want to talk to Mooning Myrtle. Who said Harry as they backtrack quickly? Richard Linkletter gave me a call once. I'm thinking about doing this movie, you know, shoots a week, a year. I was like, Okay, are you thinking about me for it? He was like, yeah, I'm wondering. I was like, yeah, man, I'm in. Like, what's the story? He was like, well, it's kind of about this boy and really him, him growing up. And I thought, first of all, I mean, how do you get funding for a movie that you're not going to see any returns on for, it was actually 12 years. That's amazing that you've got funding for something like that. I knew that nobody had done it like that. And I always wanted to work with Ethan Hawke. I always wanted to work with Rick. And to have this opportunity to make this movie was great. I just thought there would be more. It was like one of the greatest experiences of my life. It was like going to summer camp every year, going to work on Boyhood. There'd be people who started as, you know, PAs the first year. By the 12th year, they were first ADs. They'd come back as PAs on this. You know, people would leave jobs that they were in the middle of just to come back. They'd take days off. It was such an important art project for all of us. And it was so low key. It was like, oh, there's some cheese whiz and crackers over on the table. <laughs> but it was super lo-fi. At one point, Rick was ready to shoot and he called the, the movie company and they're like, oh, we forgot about it. And we've closed our books for the year and we don't have money for it this year. He's like, well, luckily my house just burned down and I just got an insurance check. So I'll forward you guys the money for this year. There's nobody like Richard Linkletter. And I mean, he's a visionary. And if you look at his body of work, I mean, he's really a true American original. I'm lucky to be her mom. I was born to be her mom. And are you excited to be here and make new friends, Gypsy? You oh, bet yes. she is. 
My mom was a therapist, so she would talk about different kind of behavioral traits different people would have. So narcissism, codependence, all kinds of different things. When I was getting ready to play Dee Dee Blanchard, I wanted to kind of figure out a way to understand this lady. I don't feel like I need to defend my characters. I feel like as a woman, I've spent a lot of my life trying to defend everything and defend my choices and defend who I am as a person. I feel liberated from that in acting. I do need to understand my characters. I have to have an understanding of them. They may be the bad guy, but they don't see it that way. I don't think she was conscious that she had uh, this need to be this codependent to such a dangerous element. I think she really did think she was smarter than the doctors. And she really did think what she saw on the internet must be what's going on. Self-deception is a very dangerous thing in its own self. I think once I find something that feels right for the character and it fits into the logic for me and the way they think, that's all I really need. Oh, a handshake is available upon request. Thank you, may I have a handshake? Ben and I had done a movie called Flirting with Disaster many years ago as actors. And then he called me to do Escape at Danamora. And he was such a great director. And then he called me about Severance, which is completely different character, completely different feeling. But I really had a lot of faith in Ben as a director. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she is. She got it. I just wasn't sure if people were going to want to watch Severance because it's so claustrophobic and it's so constrained and contained. I wasn't sure if people would want to go into that world when we were all just locked down for a year and a half. But I was happily surprised that people really responded to it. In general, people have grown up very indoctrinated to certain belief systems and I think Harmony is one of those people who's really committed to this. A lot of times institutions, they don't really have space for the individual. In fact, everything that is the individual, whether it's your instincts or your weird choices or the way you look or any of that is kind of drilled out of you. The only thing that the corporation or this entity wants you to do is to be like a worker, to go by the rules, to do all of these things. And that's a big component of Miss Cobell. Now, when she's Miss Selvig, she's kind of experimenting with what is it like for people to be neighbors with people and to have friendships and chum around with each other. Mrs. Selvig. Peace offering. Are we fighting? I just keep thinking about those damn bins. It's kind of new to her. She's kind of trying on, what is that like to not be observed? At the same time, she has an agenda, and it is for the corporation. And she is doing this in belief that this is her work. Oh, I'm sorry, would you excuse me? What the hell happened? Hit and run. I'm never going to that Walmart again. It was inspired by one of our show creators, Nancy Fishman, her sister, Marjorie, who was a drug addict and loved opera and all these different things and was a bit of a hustler, but who said to her at one point, you know what, I should be a PI. And she was like, well, that's crazy, but that you would be an incredible PI. Peggy was running away from a lot of her own pain and avoiding it and keeping her life chaotic and disastrous so she didn't really have to look or feel all of that feelings that she couldn't. Her self-deception, her conning other people. She is in this duality, being a lost person, a disaster, a destructive force, and also someone who picks up broken birds and is codependent and wants to take care of people and make the world a better place and fix everything for everyone. She's both of these things and doesn't know which one will win. And I have found some of the most beautiful people that I ever knew were addicts. And it, they had this illness and they had beautiful, beautiful qualities and a lot of them lost their battle and didn't make it. You love me, right, Denny? Are you kidding me? 
I want to be buried with this. If you really love me, you'll give me the one thing that I really crave. Mm -hmm. Which is freedom. Which is a divorce. It could be easy to make her not an addict and all these different things to clean it all up and homogenize it. But I'm not really interested in that. My whole career has been about brave choices, brave filmmakers, brave writers, and something that resonates the truth to me. And while this is a farce and this is a comedy, it's also based in some kind of reality, loss, pain, a want for connection. All these characters want family and connection in some way. But it is a counterculture comedy. And it is a farce. And it is far out. That's why I think loving people like that is pretty beguiling when you have it um, in your life and you don't know where they're gonna come out, if they're gonna come out on top or where. But they all have beautiful hearts. When I was 17, people would say, well, what do you wanna be? I'd say, well, I really wanna be a midwife or an actor. At the end of failing for one year of being an actor, I was gonna go back to school and be a midwife. I'm gonna give it my all for one year flop every day for a year, fail every day for a year, and then I'll know I really tried. And something mysterious happened during that year. I got jobs, and little by little, I just got better, and I still got, kept getting opportunities. None of that would have ever happened if I was too scared to try. There's no formula for it. You gotta kinda follow your own heart.